Good morning, developers. I guess most of you are developers. Who is not a developer? Okay. I wonder what you are doing. There is another talk as well, but it's probably quite technical as well because it's regarding upgrading from Vardin 7 and 8 to newer versions. Might be more interesting. This is quite technical talk. I would say that this is almost like a software engineer. How, how many things that you are software engineer then? Are you software engineers or something else? Okay, yeah, like, yeah. So maybe this is actually for software engineers as well. My topic today is about optimization. And uh, my actual title was quite long relating, related to something to UX. And uh, UX is there because every presentation about optimization should start with the old truth by Donald Pla. Uh, Premature optimization is the root of all evil. And uh, the UX is just for that reason. So that's a very good reason to optimize your application. When the user experience gets bad enough. Most often your time is much more valuable than the server's CPU time. You can buy Amazon servers much more cheaper than we can buy your time. And that's why the UX is here. I will be mostly talking about like actual, actual, actual optimizations and how you can apply those to your applications and how you can find the right places to optimize. But I also have a couple of tricks that help you to build better UX if you cannot optimize or if it just makes no sense because it might be expensive or it might degrade the code quality that you have. I actually put my title to this slide as a code artist because that's, that's what I do. I, I'm a developer uh, like most of the time. I don't consider myself as an engineer. But then when we go to the optimization, I should be more like an engineer because that's where you need your engineering skills. Usually software is writing. You write a good story that how your application should work and that's almost like art. But when you're optimizing, then you need to find your inner engineer inside you. I'm actually also an endurance coach and uh, I would say that I'm more engineer when I'm on my hobbies. This is usually a test that I put all my athletes in when we start working together or then like every half a year or so. So basically we put them to run very fast. We measure a lot of things. We take blood samples, measure the lactate, how it behaves. Then we can find out the right levels where to train and uh, what are the weaknesses and strength of this person. Then we plan. Then we figure out that what we should optimize in this athlete. And then we measure again. We measure that did the actions actually do what we were supposed to do? Because quite often, both in software engineering and, and in endurance coach, we do things and we try our best and nothing happens still. So if, if, if nothing works, then we probably need to think again that what is the actual reason and maybe do something a bit different. I actually have a claim that quite a many of us software engineers or software developers, we have this same sin. We don't look at the numbers too often when we develop. We just look at the code and we jump into interesting problems. And sometimes optimization is a very interesting problem. Uh, one of my colleagues, let's call him Vesa, but the name is changed of course. Uh, he has a hobby called electricity. And he has a, he has a electricity contract that changes the price every hour. I'm not sure how common that's in Germany to have this kind of pricing for electricity, but in Finland it became actually much more popular during the last electricity crisis. But Vesa also has solar panels and he has electric cars. And uh, during the crisis it made a lot of sense to start to optimize this electricity usage. And he needed numbers and he used the numbers. And he actually built this Vardin application to help him optimize that usage. And uh, surprise, it became very popular. And uh, Vesa, Vesa was actually deploying it 
on a free tire of Heroku that was still available, that, that's not available anymore. But those are very tiny servers that they provide. It's decent, it was a decent server, but it only had 512 megabytes of memory. And uh, because of the energy crisis, the popularity naturally boomed. And yeah, we all know here that Vardin is a server-side UI framework. Probably not the best solution for very, very massive applications. And Pesa, of course, decided that, yeah, it must be this one screen that they are actually using. I will implement that on the client side and then the problem is gone. And uh, Vesa is mainly a Java developer. He was enthusiastic, of course, to optimize and learn new things. So he jumped on this task and uh, created this view that has a lot of data on a timeline. And he implemented that using lit templates and passed the data for it through the Element API. And he was happy that now it's now it's optimized, it's implemented on the client side. He deployed it and he saw no out of memory exceptions anymore on the console. But actually, he didn't fix the issue. The, what happened actually was right after what happens there on this yellow line, the price of electricity went down. Nobody was interested about the electricity prices anymore. So suddenly, this 512 megabytes was just enough for his server again. He never measured what happened after his optimizations. He just kind of tried it in production and he was happy now, now it must be working. But actually he consumed a bit more memory than before with the default high charge, uh, what in charge implementation that we have. Because now this was, instead of being a Java object in the session memory, now it was JSON serialized into Java object on the server side. Because of the stateless nature, if you put something for an element in, in, in Vardin, if you put that there, it stays there because somebody might call get attribute. So Vardin actually stores that there. So every, uh, even though this was completely implemented on the server side, everything was still kept in the server side memory. So that's why the main point of my talk is that measure, find the bottleneck, and then do the actions. My talk is mainly about like examples that I have gathered from the field. And uh, I have actually been writing internal presentations and, uh, and also, also some blog posts about performance optimization for around 15 years in this company. I found some very old blog posts and uh, somehow I have been kind of the fellow, if, even if I have been working in the, in the DevRel side lately, still people come to me to ask that how, how this should be optimized. And uh, these are, I, I think these are the most common issues that you have with Vardin. We will start with this memory optimization thing that, that Vesa had in his application, but then we will continue to kind of other patterns that usually happen. I have an application here running on my server. If you can help me, because usually in, when, when finding the bottom line, you need also some load. And for that reason, you probably want to use tools called, for example, Gatlin or then uh, JMeter. They are very, they, they, they are very engineering work, things that you need to use to basically simulate a massive amount of user. This is the way how you can put your application to its knees and find out if it's, if it's finally the CPU or memory that is the bottleneck in your application. Please bring it down. I have it actually, this, this runs on this same laptop that, that, I, that I'm having here. It, is, it should be this one. And uh, this is started now. Ah, actually it's not. Let's, let's, let's restart. So I forgot to put XMX. Is it with big X? X, M, X, single dash. And uh, 32 megabytes, if I remember, is just enough to start a Spring Boot application. Okay, now it's doing the front end build because I... I think I'm 
x m s okay okay let's let's start once again restart but let's not do the build this time so let's get the build away <laughs> so Okay. But in this way. So we do, we do I think both work. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay. X, large X, M, X, 32 megabytes. This way. Now it should be running. Now, now navigate to this address. We should need roughly like 10 people, 12 people, 20 people to take it down. Does it open? It's still loading. Okay. It should be loading because it's the, <laughs> it's, it's a conference. Okay, now we have some errors. So it's Java heap space error. So now, what we should do, we should measure. What do you usually use for measuring these kind of memory errors? IntelliJ users? J Profiler. That's a very good tool. That's what I would use if I was not working for DevRel. But because I'm working for DevRel, I need to be open source dude. So if, if you have some money left outside these Vardin, Vardin subscriptions, buy J. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's, that's, that's a very good product. Uh, I'm using now in this presentation, I'm going to use Visual VM. So this is nowadays a separate tool that you can download. It used to be part of the JDK itself. And for example, in NetBeans, the profiler tooling is basically based on these same libraries. And my heavy application jar is visible there. I can monitor it and I can see that pretty much all the memory is gone. Everything is done. I can make a heap dump. And uh, now I can also compute the retain sizes. This is what you usually want to do. And then if I analyze what, what is there on the list, I can filter it. Usually, with Vardin, like with older versions of Vardin, you were actually able to type in your view here. But I need to apologize a bit here because we, we made this part of Vardin development a bit nastier in recent release. We changed the way how views are in Spring Boot application. They, they are actually now Spring Beans, so they are referenced from multiple places. So you cannot get them sorted uh, like based on the retain size anymore. But there is at least these state nodes that's still applicable for Spring Boot applications as well. This basically measures that how much session memory is used. So now we used roughly seven megabytes for uh, six and a half megabytes for session memory. And uh, what is actually taking it, you can see it from the list basically, that, okay, you can see that okay, there, is, there was five charge instances and then it died. And uh, most of the data is coming from the data series things. So this is exactly the class that you use to define in Vardin charts what you should render in the chart. So this is the tool how you figure out that what is consuming the memory. Those who are using still like plain server deployment, you will still see actual views. They will collect that, that, that active view that can be seen in, in the list, and then you can see that, okay, this is the view that is consuming a lot of memory, but otherwise you need to do some digging here. Let's make a new build. Let's fix this issue. Let's make the chart light, lightweight for the server. Okay, now it's fixed, but we need to rebuild it. Where do I have my, okay, too many terminals. Let's use this terminal. Okay, it's so, okay, now it's finally 
I needed to control C to take it down. Maven install. Let's make a new build. And then let's use the same memory. So very, very limited memory. So abs absolutely nothing. Like even compared to these tiny instances in Heroku, th th this has nothing. But my theory is now that if you now open your phones again and navigate to this m.virit.in and go to the charge view or use the direct link. Now we have already 10 people there and it's still responding. If I load it again, let's see. Taking some time now, killing the network. We are now again out of memory. But w did somebody see that? What's the latest, latest number that you have there? Probably there is, I, I would say that there should be like at least 20 people who managed to get there, probably much more. And, and uh, this is now because if we now take a new memory dump, we need to take the new application as well here. And uh, let's take a new heap dump. So now we are measuring again that did our actions actually help. Calculate retained sizes. So all uh, sort on retain size, we cannot see any more charge here. So now the actual memory was spent on something else, probably on buffers, because there was so many concurrent users. Probably if people would have been arriving like slowly to the application, it would, could have tolerated much more memory because not like memory is not used only for the sessions in your applications, uh, whatever it, it was bought in application or something else, also for buffers. And uh, for example, if there is, if, if the Tomcat needs to launch more threads to serve you, serve customers, then, then, then all the threads, they consume quite a lot of memory. I would guess that if, the, if I would have tried to optimize, which probably makes no sense to, for example, limit the amounts of threads that Tomcat is doing, we could have served everybody in this room now with 32 megabits. But yes, this was, let's, let's see actually how, how this trick was done. So this is exactly the same one in charge, but after we are drawing the chart, this is, this is, a, this is over in that method from the actual application that is called like just before the chart is rendered. I'm calling this free memory method in this tiny little hack. And I am taking the configuration field, which, is, which, which was the data series, and I just set it to null. So this, this works perfectly for each and every user, for you, even though we destroy it, but it wouldn't work if you would like to add more data later on into the same series. Then it would need the old data as well, and it would need to append it there and push the new configuration. But now that we are showing just like read-only data, we are not interested to modify that after the chart is paint. It's, it's just obsolete memory. So now we cleared that. And now we have more memory. This was quite weird piece of memory kind of hacking. Usually, usually not safe to do these kind of things, but with charts, probably quite often actually. I, I would claim that more than 90% of the charts that you paint with one in charge, they, they are never changed after you have painted those. There are certain edge cases, for example, if you have like uh, some monitoring system and then you are adding new data there. But even that can be accomplished to some level with this hack. And uh, this, this, is, this is what is doing, done in the Vesas application these days. All right, let's stop the server and uh, let's start it again in development mode. So now I need to create a clean field. And let's look at kind of the other other examples that I have here. Let me actually first enable these two new routes that I didn't want you to go because accessing these would have killed the application right away. Let's 
So now this application is running in localhost only, so you cannot access it anymore. With the rest of the cases, I don't need your help. Um, all right, now we have two more views. The first one is traditional botting view where you have bot in charge in the middle of the application. This particular view, as it's an example for this presentation, actually doesn't have anything else but the charge, but it's usually the case in your application as well. And quite often the first thing that like new bot in developers face as a performance issue, they load too much data. So as you saw, it took like ages to load this application. And uh, the way to look into why it is loading so long is also to use profiling tool. Now we need to take this application. This is now the one that I launched from IntelliJ. And uh, if we monitor, there is plenty of memory now. There is, that's not gonna be an issue anymore. Uh, but if we go to profiling, usually what I start is from the database because most often the issues are in database layer. So let's profile the JDBC connections. This is handy. So now if we reload the application, reload the same view, we will see that it's slow and profiler is nice thing that you can actually see it on the fly that okay, there was one very slow query, then there is some very slow multiple queries that are probably quite stupid queries because they just wait. And uh, yeah, I made it. I made it more slower than it used to be. I'm 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 running MySQL locally here in a Docker image, and and that's why the connection to the database server is very fast, and also the database is pretty fast on my M1 Mac. So that's that's kind of the database is too slow, too fast for me for the for the presentation. Probably not your case in in, in real life, but yes. So here we can actually see that what is taking the time and it's the database queries. And here we can track all the way that where we are actually doing these queries. We can see that, okay, here is the service service layer. So it's find details in employee service. And uh, we can also go to the UI that where we actually call this. So we are building a div here in the chart, so we are building this text to the UI. And for that, we are fetching more data from the database. This is, this is basically the same kind of things that you usually end up with Hibernate quite easily. So this is kind of N plus one query issue. And uh, this, this is now not done by Hibernate, but, but it's artificially done on the service layer. So we just pass in the ID to get more details and, and not doing that automatically through Hibernate. But, but same issue. What would be the real fix here would be to write one single query. So we should write one single query that actually gets all the data that we need here in the database. Then the database access would be much faster. Usu usually when you hit a lot of different queries for the database layer, that's bad, but if you get, give like one query for the database, the database is usually very smart to optimize that and it will be fast enough. If it's not fast enough, then you probably have some issue in your database. You're missing some index or, or some, having some kind of other configuration issue, but that, that would be the true fix. But now we, we will drop in a couple of workarounds. One workaround here would be to load this extra detail later. And for that, you can use either thread on a server. If you have push en enabled in Vardin, you could, you could, for example, have an executor service and push there more tasks. Like, like each time you render this column or, or this cell, then you would push new tasks to the, to the, to the, to the executor service and there you would make the database and then the UX would be better. It would be the same pain for the database because it would get still these all queries, but the UX would get better. I'm gonna use a kind of a hack to do that because I don't have push enabled and uh, 
I have an extension for the progress bar component that we, this, is, this is the default progress bar that we have. But with this helper, I can make it immediately into indeterminate mode. And I can also give a task for it. And when the, this task is done, this task bar uh, or this progress bar will be removed. And basically, I will move this heavy task inside this callback. And then I need to add that progress bar to the div element. And now, if Spring Boot DevTools works, this should be slightly faster. It didn't. What? Ah, now I know what's wrong. If you have profiler on, it doesn't shut down the application. So you need to remember to shut down the profiling process. And uh, then IntelliJ can actually, or, or Spring Boot DevTools can actually restart the application. Right, so now you will see that it's still low. We are still loading, actually, we have another issue here as well. But when it's up, it's, it's slightly faster, and now it makes another visit to the server, and it fetches these details, and, 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 and the UI was like responsible earlier than, than before. And that's, that's usually enough for the, for the, for, for the optimization, for the, for the user part. Let, let the user continue them, their work and then load more data later on. But let's, let's check this other issue that, that is actually even more common. So in Vardin Crit, there is the most easiest way to put rows to it. It's set items and list. I encourage everybody to use that. That's the best way to do it. It's fast and it's very easy. It's very readable code. But if you are loading the whole database, and you know that you have first users and you actually also have actual data in that table, don't do it because it will ruin your application. And that's the second mistake that we are doing in this application. It works decently, but it's actually loading a ton of rows. It's, it's, I, I think it's 10,000 rows that it loads into the memory of the JVM application. So instead of using this JVM list, we should do lazy loading. This is, this, is the, this is common technique. It's both on the UI layer, and, and on the UI layer, Vardin actually was already doing that. So when you scroll down, it went to the server, but it went to the server and fetched more rows from this Java array, or Java, Java list, and, uh, and, and that's, that's not the way to go. It's, it's, still load, it's, it's still fetching a huge amount of data from the database, that's low, and it's keeping all that data in the memory. So with lazy loading, you can do mistakes as well. I actually made this example right after the summer and I, I was using Copilot at that point because I wanted to try it out and this is what Copilot suggested me. So it suggested that make a Yoku request this way and uh, stream it and then limit it. And this is, this is basically how you use the lazy loading in body. So this query object that you get as a parameter this contains some hints that what part of the data Vardin grid needs next. And it contains the offset and the limit. And uh, somebody probably had done this in the past. And what actually happens here that we make the database query here already. So we are still making the whole database query, but after this change, there is less memory used in the server, but still the heavy database query that is the actual bottleneck as we saw in the, in the debugger. So this is the right thing to do. So we are limiting the database query already. So we change the limit clause before we actually stream and basically ignite the actual database query. And now with these changes, the loading of the UI is very fast. So it, it immediately becomes to the screen. Still this example that is on purpose very slow, that's, that's still slow. But, but you get the first 
first usable screen, very fast to the screen. Let's, let's also remove this one sleep query and then, then you can see that loading grid is actually very fast these days. Now there is it. So now, now, now it's still making a lot of queries, but it doesn't matter for most cases. It, like, like making this one big joint query with X, uh, SQL, that, that would be some engineering work and we don't want to do this because we are code artists. <laughs> and, 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 and in many applications, it doesn't make sense to waste that one hour to make the DTO and, and craft the SQL query. Just keep it that way if it's not a problem for, for your application. It might be just fine. If you have a couple of thousands of users and, 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 and a decent hardware, probably it doesn't make sense to optimize it, but like, like optimize from this point on because the UX is already good enough. Okay, let's go to the next place. I will show another tool that you should be using also when figuring out where the performance bottleneck is. And uh, this time uh, we have a UI where you choose the department and then we load some details about persons working on that department. I use the same technique here as actually as, 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 as in the grid. So I'm using progress indicator from Vadim and, it, and it's showing the user that, okay, now it's loading. That's usually very good practice to do. That's also already like a better user experience, even, even if they have to wait, but they don't have to think that is this application broken or not? Is it doing something? Yes, now it's doing something because we have a flashy animation there going on. But yes, this, this UI is really slow for some reason actually on Safari. Usually Safari is the fastest these days and then the Firefox and the Chrome is actually the slowest one. But this UI is fairly good on Google Chrome. And uh, it, it, there is a small pause, almost one and a half seconds. It's, it's, like, it's like too much, but uh, it's, it's not that bad. And uh, with this thinking, we can already guess that, yes, this is a front end issue. So some of our components, I actually know that it's the rich editor, becomes very slow on Safari when you have too many of those on the screen. Our rich editor is based on uh, a uh, JavaScript widget called Quill, and for some reason that puts Safari down on its knees if you have more than, I, I think it's 10, 10, 10 widgets. But anyways, we have other heavy widgets here. The grid is very fast, actually. That's usually not heavy, but richest editor, and I, I think this date picker, that's one of the heaviest components, actually, in our component set to render. Uh, it's, 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 it's also one of the best components that we have. It's very, it has very good UX and, and, uh, and also people who are not using our frameworks are picking that web components because it looks so pretty good, damn, pretty damn good. But if, if you have a lot of these kind of heavy components, then it might be the case that the issue is on the client side. And how you can measure that is to use the browser inspector. There is this kind of browser inspector in all major browsers in Chromium based in Safari. The one in Safari is actually probably the easiest to use and best in my opinion. Firefox Fox has one as well and uh, usually use, uh, in Safari it's called timeline, but on, on, on Chrome it's called performance tab. So you can use this now to see that what the heck is going on. So let's first load it to this state where we haven't chosen the department and then start to record, make, make, make basically a profiling for the browser side. Now it's profiling, we will choose customer service again. It will take a while and then we can go back here and click stop. In the Safari it loads it automatically here. You don't need to click it start and stop. But now we can kind of investigate the numbers here on this screen. And uh, this is actually quite often the right place to start your investigations. If, if you don't have no idea why it's slow, if it's in the server or browser or anywhere, because here you can see already that, okay, it's, it's not the server. The server visit is fairly fast. It's actually starting to do a lot of JavaScript computing here when we get the 
response from the server. When the, when the XML HTTP request is received, we process it, we render those components, and that takes too much time. You can also get this kind of numbers using, for example, activity monitor. So if we go to Safari, which takes, uh, sorry, shitload of time, and pick it up here, and now go to activity monitor, we can also see it from here that the Java process is almost idle. It's this Safari process that is taking one full CPU of my computer because luckily, luckily, JavaScript is single-threaded, so it doesn't eat whole my, whole my battery. So we, we can see it from here as well that something is actually now wrong in the browser. In the browser, optimizations are harder. I used to be a JavaScript developer, but I wouldn't like to do that optimization work again. I have done that in the past when the tooling was even worse than today. There was no this kind of inspectors, but we were basically just dumping data. There was even no console in JavaScript in the past. So, so we built our own console with Vardin version 4, and then we put timings there that we could follow. And then, then, then just like changing tho those logging messages and, 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 and then figuring out that this is the part that takes the time. And you don't want to do that. Usually you want to fix it in your Java code. So what we should do here is we should load less. So this customer service department contains 80 persons. So we are rendering 80 times these components, which is like way too much because for my screen, I can hardly fit one. So it makes, sense, it makes no sense to render them all. It's, it's, it's just fine in this case to load them from the database. That's, that's fast enough. But now the bottleneck is in the browser, so we should limit it in the view. And that's now the person details view. So here we have the department select and uh, in the value change listener, here we were logging that how much it's taking. I was using a kind of a hack to lock the client side rendering view also in the UI for these demo purposes, so you can see it here. But this is, this is now done so that I first render it and then I have one JavaScript timeout that then calls back to the server that check the time now. And, and that's why it's roughly that time, but it's, it's pretty accurate actually because the client server communication in my local environment takes no time. But now this method is taking care of the rendering of the results. And uh, here we should probably try, try something smaller. So we could, let's try with five first. That is we render five and now let's, oh, well here it's probably very fast. And we can even take the department that has a lot of thing, like really a lot of dev uh, de developers probably in the development section. <laughs> And even in Safari, it should be reasonably fast now. Yes, so now it's basically the same in Safari as well. So, so there is this not, <coughs> there is, there is not this huge performance bottlenecks that is, a, that, I, that is browser specific in this case. But now the problem is that we need to load more. So we can apply lazy loading here as well. We don't have the API that we get from Grid. Uh, we could be using a tool called virtual list or is it lazy list? I, th I think it's called virtual list, but I, ha I have a bit of allergy with the API of that component. It doesn't make my code look like art. So that's why I'm using this plain scroller component. And uh, let's first make this into a separate method. So let's iterate it in the traditional way and make that a field. Let's make it really in a really ugly way, but this will work. And then we need the maximum. So max will be minimum of i plus five for the size of results. And we will always render only five next pieces from the result set. But we will keep the results in the Xavier memory and in the, it, we will be referencing that result set from this view class. Okay, and then let's put this into a method. 
and call it, for example, render file. That's a short name, ugly name. So now we are rendering five, but still we need to render more. The ne next five, when we scroll to the end of this scroller component, this is a specialized version of the component. This is using a tiny little JavaScript hack so that we get events when we scroll to the bottom of the. This should be, in my opinion, in the official API, and I hope it's coming soon, but. <laughs> so now, okay. Let's go put it there, render five. Why does it ask a parameter? IntelliJ decided to refactor it in this way. Let's take that away because we have a results as a field as well. All right. Now we can see all the, all, all the data if we want to really scroll down and uh, it should be fast, even in Safari. So now if we scroll to the end, it will go to the server and we have more results. So we have this traditional infinite scrolling pattern that, that you see in all social media platforms, we have that implemented. So eternal field of new tweets. I think I have something that I wanted to say about this screen, but let's skip that. Maybe maybe that comes out to my mind later. <coughs> we have spent 40 minutes, so quite a good timing to look into what I wanted to say in this presentation. You should be using the numbers. Find that inner engineer in your life when you have these performance issues. Don't be the code artist, be the engineer when you're fixing performance issues. And only do that when you have actual good reason for that. UX is good, sometimes in very rare situation, electricity itself or, or, or computing price, Amazon bill may be the reason, but quite, quite often it's the UX that matters only. And uh, different kind of toolings that we have to figure out the right place. Browser inspector, that should be usually the kind of the first thing to use. So you will, you, even if you are a Java developer, learn to use that because very fast you will see that is the issue on the browser side. Should you limit the content that you have visible or is it in the server side? Then if it's on the server side, you need to take your profiler like uh, Visual VM or the one integrated into your IDE or the best profiler in JVM ecosystem system. And uh, then you can also use sometimes the data coming from observability tooling. So if you have, uh, for example, if you are using our commercial product, so this is an advertisement coming from developers. And so we have this observability tooling that you can pretty much inser inject into any, any observability platform these days, and it provides you more body specific details. You can find out that what, what view is causing, causing, causing the issues. And then you can, sometimes you need some help to cr create that load for your test server, because usually you don't wanna debug or, or test these issues in production. You will just see the, see the, see the issue there. You need to use quite often Gatling or JMeter to generate this artificial traffic on your test server that you will be then monitoring with profiling tools. Yeah, common, common methods, first of all, is to release resources. That was the one that I showed in the beginning. That was a kind of a hacky trick, but quite often you are storing too much data in your UI classes, for example, or in your service layer somewhere, you have a too big cache, cache somewhere that is taking a lot of, lot of memory and uh, releasing those helps the JVM server to collect the data and free memory for actual use for, for various things where JVM needs that memory. Lazy loading, and that should be done on all levels. We saw here, Lazy loading on the on the 
on the server side. So we were lazy loading what is held in the memory of the JVM server and how big queries we are making to the database. But we can also lazy load only the part that we show in the UI. So we had this scrolling example and then also Vardin grid does that for you automatically. So if you have that moderately sized table, it's just fine to use that set items because Vardin grid will not load that all to the client side. The client side will be fine if your server just can tolerate that amount of memory that it needs. And then minimize the amount of backend calls. So usually, usually there is a latency between your backend service or database call that usually takes most of the time. And if you cannot fix it, try caching. That usually helps. Caching would have been a very good way to fix, for example, this uh, additional detail thing that we had on the second screen here. So because, because on the first view, we only see geology here. And uh, if we would have caching on, we would have made only one query to the database layer that was slow. And then all the rendering all these other cells would have been almost like a zero operation. Uh, Yeah, and pray forgiveness. This is, this, is the, this is the number one trick that if, if you let in the UI know that your backend is slow, your users will be more happier. They, they will not be thinking that, did I break it? Is something wrong? If, if you show that progress indicator, preferably with some progress actually, if, if, you, if you can track it, with some, sometimes it's a long process you collect data from multiple data sources, you can show it that, okay, it's now in 30% 30, 30 and even if it's not a real number, that helps the user to kind of stay, stay there and they, they, will, they will not complain that much. <laughs> but you can, you can then use that time for other things like new features that, you, that are probably more important. Thank you. That's all I need to say. I'm actually already two minutes over time, but we have room for one or two questions maybe. And then a lot of more questions on the, on the hallway. Yeah, there we go. I, I don't think there is a way to make it better because I don't think Microsoft and Apple has not been successful in that. So, so every time you see these progress bars on, on operating systems when you are installing a new software, they always lie there. They always have the number there that probably, they, they have made probably a lot of like investigation that this, this helps people to calm down and wait. They have no idea how long it's gonna still take. And I don't, I don't think you have any better toolings for that. So. But, but yeah, I, I, I don't know, maybe, maybe our UX experts are better to answer that. Is it better to have this in their, in, in their indeterminate mode in the progress part that says rolls and rolls and rolls or, or have some numbers that actually change there? You could implement some kind of a moving progress bar on the client side if, 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 if the slow processing on, is on the, on the server side and just fake it. It will, it will probably produce a better UX and then when it's at the 30%, then it's ready already, and they, they will be just happy. So make it, make it pessimistic. <laughs> that's, that's my advice. There will be a good surprise in the end. Okay, it didn't finally take five minutes. <laughs> okay, let's take another one. It, it can make sense and it could have helped there if he would have done that in a wrong way, but he didn't understand the full stack that how it was working there. So in, 
in, in Vardin's element API, if, if you store a variable to the properties, for example, or, or attributes of this element wrapper, then that is saved in the JVM memory. But if you, for example, use execute JS method, that was in our last night's nice trivia, if you use that method, that's like one way only. It doesn't store that data. It, it just sends it to the server and then forgets that executed script. So if you wanna push something for the client side that you don't wanna s store on the server side, then use execute JS instead of set property. There is an enhancement to get that you could set property and forget, but, but it has not progressed. <laughs> there was just internal discussion about it. Thank you. We should quit it now, but I will be there at the DevRel booth, so if you have any issues that you wanna, want me to look in your applications, uh, we, have, <laughs> we have 10 minutes time between the talks. <laughs>